I think in the, the course of our lives, we're going to have many things that go wrong, and sometimes they go terribly wrong. It's just the way of this fallen world today where we're going to experience some kind of difficulty and tragedy as we live, and life can often seem quite unfair. I think for myself, um, I've seen people who have probably died a little too early, or that there were multiple people in my life that died at the same time. I think there, I've also heard of other people who've had terrible, tragic situations in their lives. For some people, it's that they, there was a financial decision that they made that brought ruin to their family. Some of them had gone through situations that had left them broken and disabled. In my own family, I've heard a story of where one parent had cast out her child and because she could no longer support him, told it to make it on his own and abandoned him into the mountains. You know, I've met many people who've had situations like this in their lives. And what I've found for many people is that tragedy, difficult situations become the defining thing about them, that it defines who they are. For some people, these events are actually things that they are trapped in. The horrors of this tragedy are things that now define them for the rest of their lives. For others, these things become events that they wear on their sleeves, scars that they carry on their souls, and that they can never reconcile what had happened or these feelings ever again. How about you? As Christians today, how do you guys process tragic situations? I think one of the things that I've noticed in my own life when I, as I've become a Christian, that tragic events, major life-changing events, no longer have the same power over me as it once did. I'm no longer defined by them because something about me has now changed in the way that I look at the things in my life that no longer is the lens of my situation just what I see in front of me. The lens of my situation is now seen from the redemptive purpose of God. And so I've had situations in my life that oftentimes I feel like I'm going to pull out my hair even though I have a ton of it. I feel like I'm going to spin around. I'm going crazy. I'm going nuts. But then there's a moment of clarity as a Christian, I start to ask these questions about my situation. Questions like, how is God using this? How is God teaching me to be more like him? What is God pushing me to give up or to do? And maybe the big one is, is, God, is there a bigger purpose here that I just don't see? Now, I'm not saying that Christians can't be trapped in their own situations. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is that this is one of the great values of being a Christian, that we don't have to be trapped by our situations today. That as the world kind of looks at their situation and sees it in a game of checkers, where everything is accidental, that things bump into them without purpose, it's just they were in the way, we as Christians can see the things in our life almost like a game of chess. Not that it is a game, but rather that God can use tragic events for deeper plans and deeper purposes and somehow can make even the most heinous and worst things in my life for my good and ultimately to fulfill his purposes. Now for me, this has given me great hope throughout my life and has made it much easier to process that whatever may come, whatever may be on the horizon in my life, whether it is day for day or for night, things that will bring darkness or light, I know that because I am in Christ, that I am secure in his arms, even if it costs me my life. And this is, I think, what we'll see today. We will see that there are the things that are on the periphery, things that are on the horizon that might seem like they're darkness, but actually there is light at the end because of Christ. And this is what we will see in the book of Ruth as we read through it in the next couple of weeks. And as to our main idea for today, as we're listening to the sermon today, this is the main idea that I have for you, to not lose hope when your situation seems bitter and empty, but trust God because he is faithful. Now, a little bit of the introduction of this book is necessary. So Ruth is kind of sandwiched between kind of the Pentateuch and some other books, and then kind of moving into the monarchy in terms of where it is in the historical basis. So basically, this book actually serves then kind of as a sandwich point. And what it's trying to teach us about, or teach us about is 
it's basically a story that tells us about the history or the background of one of the most major figures in the monarchy, and that's King David. And I think we do so, we do things like that today, right? Basically, when people write biographies of great people, they don't just talk about their life, but sometimes they go back history. How did we get to this point? Who are their parents? Who are their grandparents? How did we get here? And that really is part of what this story exists here today. It's meant as a hinge to teach the people of Israel about this great leader, King David, to tell them about his line and his lineage. Maybe one minor point as well is that there are some, um, there is some lineage in, in, in David's life that is not fully from Israel. And so part of the story might be to explain the providential way in which God had brought um, um, uh, this line into the focus, into Israel because of that. I think secondly, what we will see in this story is that it is a very human story. It is a story that tells us about um, how Elimelech's family is provided an heir. And it centers around the last surviving members of this family, Naomi and her, well, firstly, it's, it's just her two daughter-in-laws, but mostly it is Ruth. And what we're meant to see from this human story is that God's redemptive purposes should be seen through the lens of how we should see our lives, as we will see it in the life of Ruth and Naomi. Now, going into the story today, as you have kind of read, we are given, we start off with kind of the situation in which uh, we find the, this Elimelech family, where they are, what, what's happening, what's going on, and it sets the tone for the reader and audience to understand what they're actually going through. And I think to the original audience reading this book, when they read the situation, the first five verses of this book, it should be very, very, feel very, very uneasy about their situation. Firstly, we are told that the people are living, or this time that's happening is in the time of Judges. The time of Judges was not a great time for Israel. It's a time of great turmoil in the lives of the spiritual lives of the people of Israel, and they didn't live in God's expectation at that time. Rather, each person lived to do what was right in their own lives. And this very much exemplified the family of Elimelech. Now, one thing we're going to notice in this book is that names are actually very important. Now, Elimelech, Elimelech's name actually means God is king, but certainly he did not live this way. As we see that Elimelech's family, during a time of famine, actually ends up moving to Moab. Now, again, this is a big deal because this idea of famine, often God required Israel to just repent of their sin and he would relent of the famine, he would let go. But Elimelech said, he picked a third way. He just said, I'm going to peace out, and I'm going to go move over there, where it seems more plentiful now. And so instead of repenting, he chose to just walk away from the promised land, walk away from where all of God's promises and cares and protections landed in the land, and moved into this other land where those same promises did not happen. And he didn't even move into a neutral nation. He moved into Moab. And Moab is a, is a nation that has great contention with Israel through the Pentateuch. There are great issues between these two people. And for a great time during, or not, not too long from here, there's, there's this, uh, there, the people of, of Moab actually enslaved the people of Israel for 20 years, or about 18 years. And so you can see this contention. And we actually don't see this tension resolve until the book of Joshua. And this is the people that Elimelech decides to shack up with, that, where he pitches his tent the people that he ends up siding with. And if you think it couldn't get any worse, it gets one step even worse than that. That we learn that Elimelech's family is actually from the line of Ephraim, and their main location is from Bethlehem, which means that he is an Israelite, and what he should be doing is following God's laws. But already from the beginning of the book, you can see that his family marries foreign nations, which they are prohibited from doing. So what we see from Elimelech's family is they live in a precarious situation, and he has left the safe, safe harbor of God's land and his commands. Now, at this point in the story, the family enters into a crisis point, and that crisis point is all of the men in the family die. Elimelech and his two sons, all of them perish, leaving only the women alive. 
Now, for us today, not that losing family is a big deal, but there is some kind of ways that we can recover today. If you lose your family today, God forbid, there are lots of programs that we can get into. Uh, there are a lot of, like, uh, you can, you can, it's very much easier to find work here. But in that time, if you were to lose specifically all the men of your household, your prospects are very dim. Because all of your hope for, um, pro, like for, for more progeny, your hope in security, provisions, all of that is dashed. You can't do any of that now. And this is the situation that Naomi finds herself in. That her husband and children are gone, her well-being and protection are gone, her progeny is dead, her security is over, and she is left, as she sees it, all alone with her two daughter-in-laws. Now, at the end of this book, in verses 19 to 22, we actually see the depth of Naomi's feelings as she returns to the land of Bethlehem. And the reason why she returns is there is that she needs to get food, and so she remembers that God at one time, God, God was actually providing food to her people. So she goes back to her hometown, which is Bethlehem, which is House of Bread. So she wants food, so she goes to the House of Bread. And there she is greeted by her people, and they ask, is this Naomi? And then at that point, she vents her frustration and bitterness to the people, which she says in verse 20 and 21. She says, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt with very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? And just to summarize what she says here, she's saying that she's frustrated. Don't call me by my name, Naomi, which means pleasantness. Call me Mara, which means bitterness. Because this is the way she sees that God has reacted to her. And that she, when she left Bethlehem, she was full, and now she's, now she's returning. She is empty. She has nothing, no family, no security, no progeny. And she thinks, just like a court case, that God has answered uh, against her, maybe unjustly, and said that she is actually guilty, she's done something wrong, and that this calamity is brought against her directly. This is the way she has thought about her situation. Now certainly, I think we all here can agree that Naomi's situation is less than ideal, and that she can, she, we can understand why she is so bitter in her situation. But my question is, is she right? Naomi is very upset, but she sees the world in a very checkered terms. That if bad things happen to her, it must be because that God has to show his wrath to her. However, this is, I think is far from the truth. This section says nothing about that God is judging her at this point of time. That the things that have happened to her are not because of judgment. Furthermore, I think that if God was judging her family and herself, why was she the one that was spared? So certainly, I don't think that the reason why these things have happened are because of judgment. I think for us today, I think we can also know that there are many stories in the Bible, very human stories, of people going through difficult and tragic situations, and they, they go through them not because they've incurred God's wrath. And I think one great example of this, one which we think that Naomi should know, is the story of Job. Certainly. God can bring wrath against people. But not every instance of tragedy is because God's judgment is behind it. And I think this is something that we clearly need to hear. I think what actually brings about the unfairness that we face today in our world, in Naomi's case, is that our world lives in a, we are living in a fallen world. A world where sin and death reign in our mortal bodies, where Satan sells power over the world, and where death happens because of sin and because of Satan. And this is really the direct cause of what has actually caused her family to experience this grief. Now, I do think that God could have brought judgment to Naomi to allow her to fully experience what life outside of the promised land actually means, yet God doesn't allow her to experience the reality of living outside the promised land where God's promises and care are centered on. But rather, he shows her grace. When I thought about this, I realized that I'm not like this. I've been a father for the last, I think, three years now. I've just recently had a new child. 
And one thing you really learn about yourself is how do you actually deal with um, when your daughter or your son makes a mistake? So I realize there's a difference between Hannah and me. So Hannah, when Constance does something wrong, she's an encourager slash caring person. That's the way that she parents. For myself, I am what they call a fault pointer, or someone who allows the person to experience the reality of their bad choices. So let me give you a couple examples. Recently, my daughter had some toys out on the floor, and she was running, and she tripped over them and started crying. She had a huge bruise. Hannah, being the loving person that she is, basically asked her, probably as most parents should, are you okay? Me as a parent, I said to her, that's what happens when you leave your toys on the ground. Let me give you another example. So sometimes your children have washroom accidents, right? The loving parent will say, let's clean you right up. Me, I say, maybe next time you'll take more trips to the washroom so this doesn't happen again. It's very different, right? One shows grace and love in the situation, one is a fault pointer, and one who allows that person to experience their situation. Now, the reason I tell you this story is because I think God could very much be a fault pointer in this situation. He could say, aha, Naomi, all of this you brought upon yourself. You lived in the land outside of me, you did all these things, and you expect me to now do something about it. I think you would have said all these things. But God isn't like that. Our God didn't allow her to experience the fullness of her choices. He covered her judgment with grace. And though Naomi may not see it, and we will not see it till the end of this book, God has not testified against her, but rather he has given her hope and grace all throughout this story. Now, in this story, God is actually not mentioned very much in terms of acting in the story, but it is assumed by both the readers and the writer that God is an active element in every story that we read in the Bible. And one of the ways in which we see God's gracious action to Naomi is by allowing her to hear that in Moab, that God was working in Israel. She's in a complete foreign land, far from the nation of Israel. Not like information today, but in, in a completely different land where there might be some cutoff because there's some tension. And she gets a chance to hear that there's provision in the land of Israel. Now, this hearing of there, there's land, there's food in the land of Israel actually sets the chorus of where Naomi will go next. It is such an important element here because it's where she meets all the characters, where all the redemption happens, and it sets her eyes back into the promised land where she is about to go. And so it is such an important part of the story, and it's not just by accidents or ha happenstance that she hears this information. It is God who works in the background of human history. So that's the first way. But I think the bigger way in which we see how God is active in showing grace to Naomi is actually through Ruth. Now God has put um, in um, Naomi's life this refreshment that will fill her again in the daughter-in-law of Ruth. And Ruth means refreshment. And Ruth is this character that the first chapter of Ruth is really trying to establish as a very important character in the story. But if you actually read how people respond to Ruth in the story, she actually isn't that important altogether. She's almost like a shadow or invisible to people around her. Firstly, when her and Naomi both go to Bethlehem, they don't even see Ruth. They don't greet her. They just ask, hey, hey, hey Naomi, is that really you? It's almost like she's invisible. Worse yet, when Naomi vents her spirit and is frustrated, she says she is empty. That's really rude. Imagine your wife is next to you, and you basically said, it's like I'm li living as a bachelor. She has Ruth. And Ruth is this Moabite woman, but she's gonna, she exchanges her identity as a Moabite to being an Israelite so that she can follow after Naomi. And in verse 16, after Naomi has made this pitch to her daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth, and telling them, leave, go home to your family, start a new life, Ruth embraces the tragedy and makes a strong statement of loyalty as she says follows, 
Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. From where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so, so to me, and more also, if anything, but death departs from me. In this line, Ruth is, actually, Ruth is actually giving up everything. She's giving up her national identity. She's giving up her gods to fo- all this so that so she can be with Naomi to the point where she says, let God be the one who seals this promise. This, uh, th- this, th- these words are so powerful. They are one of the sweetest and most powerful commitments we will see in the entire Bible. It is a statement as strong as a marriage a covenant or covenant of marriage. In fact, if somebody said this at a wedding, I would clap. This is a great, these are great covenant vows that husband and women, husband and wives could make, and yet this is the covenant that Ruth makes with Naomi. So when we look at Ruth and what, what Ruth will represent to Naomi, is that Ruth represents what covenant loyalty actually looks like. And what it means, it means that when you love somebody, when you say that you're committed to somebody, this is what this commitment should look like. And this is important because this is a a kind of a, a pointer to Naomi, this is the way that you should have loved your God, how you should have been faithful and loyal to your God in the same way that Ruth is loyal to you is the way that you should have been loyal to your God. But it's also the way in which God covenantally loves Ruth, but also in the way that God covenantally loves us. Ruth is a great example of covenant faithfulness, not just in the way that we should be covenant faithful, but how God has been covenant faithful to us this morning. For us as Christians, we should follow God after, follow after God no matter where he sends us, no matter where he tells us to go. He is our groom, our head, the head of our people. We should trust him. He should lead us, even if it costs us our life, because our lives are his, and he loves us deeply. And for God to us, the best way he demonstrates this covenant faithfulness that we look like Ruth is through the way in which he sends Jesus Christ, his son. I just want to read quickly, for one of the commentators this week spoke about this, talk about how Christ is is the example of covenant faithfulness. And let me just quickly read this to you. He writes, In the first place, the gospel answers our doubts that God really has our best interests at heart, who left his father's house to come and live with us, even to the point of death, against whom did the Almighty's hand truly go out in bitter judgment, even though he had no sin of his own, though he would deserve such punishment. Jesus is the answer Naomi needs. Jesus is the answer that we need. Jesus is our Emmanuel. He took God's Old Testament declaration that I will be with you and lived it out to the fullest extent. He left the glories of heaven in order to say to us, where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Even death could not shirk his identification with us. He died and was buried just as we are. In his grace, we have clung, he has clung to us, uniting our souls with his in eternal union. As a result of that covenant bond of union between Jesus and his people, no one and nothing, not even death, can even separate us from Christ. If you want to see what it means to be a Christian, what it meant to be an Israelite, what it means to follow after God, you can see it in the life of Ruth. If you want to see how God loves you and how he unites himself to you, you can see it in Christ. But this is what it looks like. This is the example that we have. So I will say that Naomi was very wrong in her view of her bitterness. Though we can understand her bitterness at this point, she's still very wrong. But irregardless of what she has said, God is still caring for her and showing her grace because Ruth becomes this conduit of grace for her and is a model of covenant faithfulness. And we should strive to love God in the way that Ruth loves Naomi, in the way that Christ loves us, and to see how how God has loved us through Christ. But now I want to return back to a question I asked at the beginning. For you and me, what is our outlook in tough times? 
do you find that when bad things happen, when terrible tragedies occur, is your mind stricken with bitterness when things go wrong in your life? You know, have you ever seen horses race? They have these blinders that they put on their face. And the reason being is so that the horse is unaware of all the other things that are happening, but it really limits their vision so they only see the road ahead. And I would argue that bitterness does the same thing. Bitterness narrows our vision to the size of a keyhole so that we cannot see what God is doing in the background. In bitterness, this anger that people have completely focuses no longer on God, but focuses on themselves, asking, how could God allow me to suffer? And all they're focused on is their pain and their loss, and they're consumed by tragedy, as we see as Naomi is today. That all of her hope is placed upon what these physical markers in her life and not upon God. I've met Christians in my life who've left the faith for the same exact reason. Because they had experienced tragedy and loss and pain and suffering. And they leave the faith because of that. Now I can say that I'm not that I don't empathize with the difficulty or tragedy that they have. But what Bible have they been reading this entire time? Much like, I, as I said about Naomi, about the stories that she should know, the Bible is full of stories of people who've experienced the frailties of life because God has not promised us in the new covenant that life is free from these things. In fact, the one that they love most, the one that they should worship and care about, Jesus Christ, he himself goes through a tragic death of pain and suffering and of wrath. All he did not deserve and if, and if this is our maker, if this is our master, will our, our lives not imitate that in some way? So what exactly do we believe in? What exactly are we reading? Suffering really makes, or really puts our, our theology to work in tough times. Theology means, if maybe in the simplest terms, like what you know about God, how you, how you think about God, and these things matter because they go into overtime as tragedy occurs. Because it makes sense of your suffering. It makes sense of your difficulty. And faithfulness to God, people who trust him, can widen their vision even when they suffer in these terrible situations. They can see the forest of grace and, see, and, don't, and not just to see the trees of despair. This is what faith does. This is what faith can do. Now, here's my illustration of the story, and I don't want, kind of don't want to tell it because I get emotional every time I tell the story, but it's of my favorite missionary, and his name is Adnir Judson. Adnir Judson was a Baptist um, missionary that worked to Burma and Myanmar. Uh, we certainly have someone there right now, but unlike going in 2023 or 20, in the 2010s, he was going in 1913. And he was actually told by another very famous missionary, William Carey, not to go to that place because it was, it was, there was imminent death there. The people they had sent before did not last. And yet, Judson went anyways. And everything that William Carey said was true. He experienced hardship. He experienced loss. He had, his, he had multiple wives die on the trip. Not that he was a polygamist. He just got married, and they would die on him, and he'd come back, get married again, and it would die, he should die again. Most of his children died either on the journey or through sickness or being in the jungle. There are these horror stories of him actually being in the jungle, going into the, being in the prisons because they would throw, throw him, they would lock him up, and he would be tormented by mosquitoes and all of these, these different um, infestations around him. In his biography that someone had written, he basically speaks that he wanted to give up of life itself because life was so hard, it was so difficult, and yet he still trudged on realizing the promises of God, the calling to Zion. For me, his life was harder than Job's. And his life is actually more akin to Paul's, who speaks about the difficulties of being a Christian and the difficulties we see of him today. 
And Justin dies at sea, and his friend writes about him, how few there are, this is from Desiring God who writes this, he says, how few there are that die so hard. And yet one of the last things he accomplishes changes the mission field there. They finally finish a vernacular of the Bible and a dictionary to accompany it. And then, th then, then thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Burmese people come to faith because what he's done. And if Adnir Judson had continued to wallow in his pain and had gave into his despair, which I think all of us would have just said, we understand, how far back would that mission have gone? Where would Myanmar be today? It is this lasting, long vision of God's purpose for our lives, for his life, that God was able to use for a purpose in one singular man who should not be able to accomplish what he did but was able to because he was committed to the mission of God and overlooked the suffering that was befalling him. Maybe one way to put it is that him and his family gave up their lives so hundreds of thousands of people could live in Christ. This is the difference for me about wallowing in our bitterness and embracing the tragedy in our faith. Now, if you're one of those people today who have gone, who's gone through tragedy, who's going through tragedy, who's experienced tragedy, I unfortunately have a tough thing to say to you is I don't have a, really have a lot of experience talking to people about the situation outside of my friend group. I can only tell you for myself what counsels me out of those situations. I think number one, what comforts me is to hear, number one, that I'm sorry for your situation. Number two, I will sit here as long as you, knew, as you want to talk about it. But more importantly, I'm not just a commiserator. I want clarity. And this is the clarity that I could give you if you suffer in this way. Firstly, that you are loved and secured in Christ. To keep your eyes on grace, on God's grace to you. To not miss what God is doing. Number three is that you are not defined by this tragedy. And that you can have peace with this tragedy because it is all in God's hands. I don't have a lot of commiseration. I'm just not built that way. I'm not em empathetic this way. What I am built is for clarity. And this is as clear as it gets for us who suffer in Christ, suffer in this world, that we have a clarity of identity, clarity of where we stand in God, and a clarity that nothing happens in our life that's in vain. And it's this clarity that Naomi ultimately misses on. Now, there's still a number of chapters that are still to come in this book, of which I think mostly Pastor Kevin is going to be preaching on. But these are some ways which I think things will become more clear as this book is read. Number one is that there's this irony that Naomi calls herself mar or bitterness, and yet they forget or she forgets or doesn't know the story of when the Israelites actually end up in a place called Mara. In that story, the people of Israel, much like her, also need provision of food, provision of drink. They're thirsty and hungry, and yet the water here is bitter to the taste. Much like for Naomi, her life is bitter to the feel. And yet God has made that water sweet for them to drink. And this is exactly what God will do for her, that she, they will turn her time of being in bitterness, her time of Mara, into sweetness. And that God will ultimately provide for her. And the conduit which God will do that through is through Ruth, which God will make these things happen in her life, will make them sweet and full because of what God has been doing through Ruth. So this is my conclusion today. Don't waste away your life in bitterness. Instead, see all of God's grace around you and rest in him because he is faithful. We've read the story today of, of Naomi who is overtaken by her bitterness, that she doesn't see all the things that God is doing or all the things that she has wrought. And yet God is, is gracious and loves her and cares about her and will do amazing things through her line, because David is coming soon. 
So I hope that you and I, as we continue to live this life, as we continue to go through this week, until we, to, we continue through COVID and whatever else may come, we can accept the tragedies that are coming because our God reigns and he loves and cares for us and suffering will find its ultimate rest in him because he is faithful and he will do things for our good and for his good pleasure. Amen.